you have to adapt. You have to grow and you have to lead. If you're not leading, then you're going to be left behind. And if people are too slow to react, they're not going to be able to provide the same level of quality as everybody else. And after that, they're not going to be able to collect the same level or negotiate the same contracts. After that, they're also going to lose patience. If you're leading this, then you're setting the pace and that's where you want to be. Omer Dror, founder CEO of LinksMD. I'm very thrilled to have you on the Scope Forward show. Very, very warm welcome. Thank you, Praveen. It's uh, great to be here and thank you for having me. Yeah, we're going to have an exciting chat about data or why data is, as people keep saying, is the new oil. But before we get started with all that, Omer, let me play an introduction for you. So I have a digital assistant here talking about you. So let's uh, hear Jenny first and then we'll get started. Ladies Great. and gentlemen, meet Omer Dror, a dynamic force at the forefront of innovation. As the CEO and co-founder of LinksMD, Omer is on a mission to transform the landscape where data science meets medicine. Omer's journey began with a passion for architecting cybersecurity solutions, ensuring the safety of vital data. But he didn't stop there. He ventured into the realm of advanced natural language algorithms and big data technologies, pioneering the prediction of trends in social media. As chief technology officer of his previous venture, he assembled a world-class tech team in Israel, experts in running scalable machine learning. With a BSc in E from Tel Aviv University and an MSc from the Weizmann Institute of Science, Omer's academic prowess shines. His research focused on ensemble learning techniques in machine learning, making him a true authority in the field. Omer is not just a tech enthusiast, he's a fervent advocate for data and privacy. He firmly believes that striking the right balance between safeguarding and sharing data will revolutionize modern medicine. Get ready to be inspired as Omer Dror shares his insights and vision to help you unlock the value of your data. Pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she has a mind of her own. Uh, so she, I just watch out that she doesn't make up stuff. Uh, so Omer, I think it sets the tone for the stuff that we're going to discuss today. Let's get started. Just for context, why don't you lay the ground and uh, tell us what LinksMD does as a company, as a platform, and then we'll go from there. LinksMD is about making healthcare data accessible. We've started the company a few years ago. I come from a cybersecurity and a data science background, and I spent many years dealing with sensitive information on one hand and how to deal with the cybersecurity risk of that information. And on the other hand, how to make the most of it, you know, getting into actionable insights based on the data that's out there, building predictive models, machine learning models, AI. And when we started Lynx, we're really looking into all of the data that's accumulated inside of the uh, healthcare space in general and specifically within healthcare provider systems. And there's a ton of data. You know, like you said, data is the new oil. And if you look back 10 or 15 years, there wasn't a lot of digital data collected within the healthcare space. And what happened over the last decade is that the entire industry got digitized. And now there's all of that data out there within the healthcare provider systems, within everybody that's taking part in this ecosystem, but still it's very, very difficult to take that data and leverage it and to build new machine learning models and get actually new therapies into the space, evaluate the efficacy and the quality of the treatment that patients are getting. Uh, using that data. And that's because of all of the limitations. And the limitations being that the data is sensitive, that it's mostly unstructured and very difficult to deal with from an IT perspective. And also the fact that it's siloed. You know, there are a lot of healthcare companies, each is collecting their own data. And to really get to the point where you can use that data to make it into something that's valuable, something that can actually assist with all of these challenges, you need to get to high volumes of data and uh, improve the predictive ability of the data. So that's what we started Links to do. We're building trusted data environments where anybody really that has access to data can use those trusted data environments to share the data with scientists, with researchers, with developers in a way that's secure, 
that's privacy preserving, and also that keeps them in control of the data. So instead of giving the data out to people losing control of it and not actually knowing what's happening with all of this data, they can actually put it inside the secure place that they control and get those scientists to come in and explore the data there and build the machine learning models there. Thank you. Why did you choose uh, healthcare? And uh, I know you're working in gastroenterology. So why specifically GI? First of all, generally about healthcare, it's a massive problem. When you compare uh, the healthcare industry to all of the other industries out there, everybody's already using data. Okay, If you look at uh, finance, banking, you look at media, telco, all of the other verticals are well ahead of the curve in terms of how they're using the data and the types of insights that they're getting from it. Healthcare is really, really far behind. And the reason for that is the silos. And there are other reasons because of the data, the sensitivity, and all of the stuff that I've mentioned. That's on one hand. On the other hand, it's the biggest opportunity for actually making a difference. So I chose healthcare because everything else that I've done in my past, I wanted something that had a clear mission to it. And I think in healthcare, you can actually make a difference. And especially with all of this data coming together, or at least being generated, the opportunity for disruption is the greatest. Now, in gastroenterology, this is one of the most interesting places as far as I'm concerned. One reason for it is that it impacts a very big portion of the population. The other is that it's an outpatient specialty that is using multimodal data with uh, endoscopes and all of the imaging and the digital pathologies, in addition to the medical records and all of the reports that are generated. So it's a tough problem in terms of the types of data, the unstructured part of the data, and actually bringing all of this data together to create insights and improve the quality of care. And the other thing is that it's a very separate or fragmented market. Okay, Most of uh, patient care is happening in the community. There are a lot of independent physician practices out there, and there are a lot of PE back groups that are forming. Some of it is happening within systems. And one of the challenges in healthcare data, and specifically with gastroenterology, is that the data isn't collected in one place. And to actually create you know, real value using the data, you need the volumes. You need the ability to look at not just, you know, thousands of patients, but hundreds of thousands and millions of patients. And to be able to do that, you need to solve the problem of the silos. The ability to create solutions just by going after one single medical center or one single practice, okay, if you look at an academic medical centers, are they seeing a big enough volume of patients to actually understand disease progression, the journey of the patient, and in medicine in general, people are used to looking at studies with hundreds of participants and in extreme cases, thousands of participants. When you look at that next stage of what we can do with data, that's not enough. That's what's so interesting about gastroenterology, taking all of those practices, the healthcare that's being done in the communities and leveraging that to actually get into insights. So I have a bunch of questions, but I'll start with something that you said that you require large volume of data and the private equity led consolidation or consolidation, which is generally happening in gastroenterology and in medicine as a whole is helpful uh, to get all this data together. Help us understand why this volume of data is important for extracting value from it. You look at a physician practice. Okay, and an average physician sees uh, five to 8,000 patients in their practice. Medicine in general, has a very long tail of conditions and diseases. Okay, so if you look at, at that practice, you know, a lot of people are coming in for doing uh, screening colonoscopies. But then the interesting parts that differentiate from the norm, that's where you need to look at to learn something about better diagnostics. When you're treating patients, that also becomes a very small part of the total patient population. So right now, biologics is a very hot place. You know, a lot of research being done, a lot of drugs that are getting to market. When you think about that space and you want to look at a large patient population, let's see everybody that's on biologics. You want to compare how different treatments apply to different segments of the patient population. You need numbers to do that. You can only start seeing the pattern in classical statistics when you get to hundreds of cases. And if you actually want to look at progression of disease, 
you want to look through time and see how things have changed, you need that uh, volume to grow actually exponentially. Okay, so the more complex question you want to ask, the larger sample size you need. That opportunity around practices consolidating and getting into very large patient populations, millions of patients, actually opens up the possibility of the flow of patients looking at the workflow and improving the workflow also, looking operationally at all of these processes and see how they act, improving that and clinically looking at the quality of care, investigating what gets you to better outcomes, reducing the variability and getting all of the patients to get the best possible care. Can you share a couple of examples, like very specific examples on the kind of questions that we might be able to ask or you're probably asking currently based on these large data set models? I'll start with, you know, operationally. Operationally is the side that makes the most impact financially many times on the practices themselves. And when you look at things like no-shows and how they impact the bottom line, it's a pretty big thing. You know, people not showing up for appointments, time wasted, dollars spent. One example of a study we did is looking at no-shows for a given provider and being able to predict what are the no-shows going to be a few days into the future, a few weeks into the future and also three to four months. And what that allows you to do is, you know, deal with it and actually improve the way you do scheduling so that you're not wasting time. Another example is looking at biologics, more on the clinical side, looking at different patient populations by demographics, of course, and location, but also by looking at the labs together with the medical history and trying to segment the patient population and predict who is going to react better to what type of therapy? Let's break this down a little bit, right? Like, so you get all these large data sets or your consolidated data sets from multiple groups, providers and whatnot. In your platform, do you have several AI algorithms uh, that are using that data, learning from that data? And then are you building predictive models or these are preset predictive models that already exist that people can look up? Uh, I have a part two of this question. I'm going to ask it so you can answer it all together. If you use any of the generative AI tools that are available right now, you can very freely ask questions in you know natural language, and it is able to uh, provide answers. It also does very good analysis and whatnot. Uh, so does your platform do similarly, or uh, how is the interaction uh, for the practice or the provider and uh, your platform? First of all, the platform is using a federated model, okay? So we're actually not aggregating all of the data into one place. Every one of the healthcare partners that are part of this ecosystem gets their own trusted data environment, and those are connected. So you can look at data together, but everything is, you know, all of the compliance and privacy issues around this are very, very tightly managed, and, and the practices have their control over it. One of the issues with uh, Gen AI and Open Chat GPT and large language models is that you actually have to send the data to those uh, online servers and get the response back. And when you're dealing with sensitive data, that's a problem. Having those trusted data environments, which is an AI platform, actually allows you to first of all, fine tune and train larger language models on the data that's sensitive inside of the environment. And the other thing is basically you have your own large language model in that place. And it's not only Gen AI algorithms, it's also uh, traditional AI algorithms. One very important aspect of our platform is the onboarding piece, um, which <clears throat> We've built a lot of AI around data ingestion and understanding so that the overhead of onboarding onto the platform actually doesn't fall on the practice. It's a very short time to set up and get all of the data into the environment and also map it and catalog it so you can start building cohorts. And now to, to answer about the interfaces, once the data is in the platform, there's a data set catalog and you can say, okay, I only want to look at uh, IBD patients and only ones that have been treated with specific type of biologic and only ones that are in a certain geography can build that cohort. You can drag it into, so one way you can look at those patients is through a natural language uh, interface, but you can also drag it into an analytics interface and start plotting 
looking at the uh, flow of the patients, you know, how many were treated with each drug, when was the next follow-up, what were the results of the labs, and then, you know, if they switched, what did they switch to, and what were the outcomes. And you can do that through an analytics interface. Other interface that we have is a data science interface. So the platform is built to actually be able to dig into the data. This is done by practices and scientists and the life science companies and all of the uh, partners, each based on their level of access that they're given. But it's basically the same interface. Let me ask you a broader question now, like so, which is all these AI trends, which have uh, really multiplied in the last few months uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, that has been brewing under the surface for the longest time and then it's just exploded and everybody has come out of the woods and they're showing off and it's really multiplied but you've been around you know for a while prior to that can you lay the landscape of ai right now as it relevant to healthcare and gastroenterology gen ai is exploding okay everybody's talking about gen ai and it has great applications into the medical field and we've just done a workshop about that we've used it to look at medical records uh, and ask questions about those patients that's uh, one thing that's i think the most hyped uh, but also with time we'll find a lot of applications for this technology another thing that's happening is everything to do with computer vision especially when you look at endoscopy and also digital pathologies these things are very, very impactful. They're, they're going to save a lot of time, improve the accuracy. Then there's traditional machine learning, everything to do with the labs, uh, all of the structured data, and being able to use that data to predictions on a specific patient population. Now, I think the real exponential growth comes from actually being able to integrate those three aspects together, you know, text and everything to do with language models, the medical imaging, and also all of the structured data that's in there. And when you bring the different modalities into one place, that's when AI is starting to look at the patient like a patient and not like a set of images. And that's what the doctor is doing. I think it was like five or six years ago, Google came out with a paper on radiology and they looked at the images. It made the news, it was a big thing because it was the first time where they took a, an AI model and compare it to radiologists and the AI model actually performed better on these images than radiologists, which was amazing, but it doesn't give the complete picture. That AI model only looked at snapshots at the images themselves. And the radiologist has a lot more information when they do their work. And that wasn't taken into account in that study. And it's actually a much harder problem from a computer science perspective, taking in multi-model data. And especially when the data is sensitive and it's coming in from different systems, it actually makes the problem much, much tougher. And when we're able to take all of these different fields in AI and tie them together to look at the patient population in a unified way, in terms of the data itself, that's going to get us to a whole new level in terms of health equity. And you know, bringing, reducing the variability of care, getting uh, patients the best quality of care possible, and also turning it into a learning system. Doctors having the data to know when they've done well, when they've made mistakes, uh, uh, and that's a uh, pretty controversial uh, statement, and how to improve, okay? You have to know uh, what actually happened to the patient if you're going to improve. Uh, and I think everybody wants to improve. AI is going to help that tremendously. So how far are we from this holy grail? I love the vision that you painted. You know, there's multi-modality data, right? Like, so it's coming from different, different, different silos. And uh, if you look at the landscape now, there are a bunch of startups that are in the computer vision space in GI. They're taking the endoscopy images. Uh, they're giving the green boxes. They're saying, oh, this is a polyp. They're classifying. They're doing all that. That's one set. Then, you know, there is you, like you're analyzing both clinical and business data and you're culling out insights, you know, from that. And then I'm sure the pharmaceutical companies are also have their own uh, data tools and uh, they're building, you know, something on those lines. When all this converges and when you're going to get whole person data, I'm using the word, you know, the whole whole person uh, data and you have these AIs talking to each other. Uh, you are understanding the patient as a whole, and uh, you are getting insights. I love the radiology example as well, 
uh, because that's only one aspect of the patient. What if you were to combine insights from all the medical records, insights from all the physical exams done for those patients, insights from all the medications that they were on, you know, then you're talking all kinds of data here and uh, your, uh, the insight that the AI will be able to give uh, will be very different. Uh, so my question to you is, how far are we from that vision based on where the industry is uh, right now? I think we're getting closer. The opportunity is enormous. And if when you look at these different things that start to pop out in the AI world, underneath the surface, it's the data that's the limiting factor. Okay, so if you look at an AI company looking at video endoscopies, they need to work really hard to collect those videos. And then when they get access to them, that's what they have. So they can build the AI models, uh, but then to actually marry it with clinical data, that's a whole different level of complexity. Same thing uh, goes for anybody that's processing, looking at claims, looking at operational or, or administrative uh, workflows, and just uh, medical images and pathologies. To get to a point where all of this needs to come together, we need to solve the data accessibility issue, and we need to solve the sensitivity and look at it together. And it's actually simpler than solving the infamous problem of interoperability in the US. Uh, so I think we're actually much, much closer to it than one or two years ago. Okay, it's moving at a very, very fast rate and it's only accelerated. Very interesting. The whole point or the problem of data accessibility is not actually a technical problem. It's a human psychology problem, you know, if you will. Uh, because uh, I remember an example. So this was a, a large hospital chain, not in the US, but the tension for the leaders, they were clinical leaders and so on, was that, but this is my data. And if I, you know, give it away, then, you know, they're going to take advantage of the data that I'm generating. It's my data, it's my assets. So what happened in that story was nothing. You know, so the data just stayed and it got old and uh, nothing really happened. It was a terrible example. I knew where it was all going to go, but the uh, psychology plays such a strong role here because if you don't share, then it's no use. But if you share, you know, you're worried that, hey, like, you know, how am I going to benefit from it? Uh, so any reflections or comments on that? Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's a very delicate balance between being protective of the data and at the worst case, being the most protective means nobody's doing anything with it. And on the other hand, if you just make it public, then sensitivity is an issue, privacy, and, and of course, the commercial aspects of it. If you look at you know the number of companies and, and the amount of research being, that's being spun out of every data set that's made public, you know, every one you look at is, you know, hundreds of cases. That's how strong the value of the data is. You have to understand it. And if you're collecting a lot of data, it's still a very heavy lift to actually take advantage of it. And that has to happen through partnerships, through collaboration in the ecosystem. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. And of course, people that see this in a strategic way, and especially when you've made the work to consolidate the data and to look at it, to get it at least into one place, one EMR, okay, be able to look at the entire group in one way. That's a very heavy lift to have great foresight to do that when you start uh, consolidating practices. But it puts you at a huge advantage over everybody else because you can look at the quality across the platform. People have to be very thoughtful in how they approach it, but they can't stop at the gates, you know, already done so much work into uh, collecting the data, whether they've put it in one place or not. If you don't share the data, you're actually are a gate for change. You're slowing down improvement and you're slowing down quality. To really learn what works and what doesn't work, you need to dig into that detail. Uh, we keep hearing of data being the new oil. Why is that? Why is data the new oil? And what the heck does that even mean? The statement that people have been using for a long time, I think the analogy is even better for, for healthcare because one thing with oil is that it's underground and you need to pull it out. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. The data is underground and we need to pull it out to make it work. But also think about the industry. Okay, now talk maybe a little bit about the life sciences side. Okay, if I have a uh, drug or a device that's going to market, you know, it takes $1.1 billion to get a, a new drug to market. The ability to use real world evidence to support 
that process of getting the drug approved, it's a huge investment. So reduce the investment, reduce the time that it takes, and actually improve the statistics because you can look at much larger patient populations. Now, once the uh, drug is approved, it's all about creating, generating evidence. Okay, I want to see for which patients is this drug really effective. And if I can show that conditions A, B, and C, my drug is more effective than other drugs, when you're able to analyze larger cohorts of patients, I think you can get to a place where you're improving care and reducing cost. The big picture is clear. The clinical need is very, very clear that it is going to help patient care. Economic benefit on the big pharma side, the biotechnology company side, that is clear. And I'm going to be very direct and ask this question. Why should the average gastroenterologist generating all this data every single day care? Like Because uh, one question that will pop in everybody's head is, oh, if they have to use any AI platform, anything, who's going to pay for it? And, you know, because the insurance companies are busy reimbursing for, you know, in a managed care model, why should they even bother? What is the economic case here for private practice GI? I think there are four ways of making money here. I'll start with the internal ones, which is, you know, if I can look at the data, improve my operations, reduce my operational cost and keep the same uh, quality and even improve quality. Okay, I'm saving money. Two is... Um, if I have big enough patient populations, I can start using the data in negotiation with payers. And that's a big thing. Today, the payers have all of the strength in negotiations. They have all of the data and the practices basically don't have anything. Once practices are able to take all of that data and prove to payers that they're providing top level quality care, they can actually have the upper hand in contract negotiations. Three and four are the uh, working with uh, pharmaceutical companies. You need to get to scale in order to do that. But there's two types of revenue generating opportunities here. One is based on real world evidence. So, you know, just uh, data licensing, creating a new revenue stream based on all of the data that's created. And two is research, okay? And one is actually leading to two. So so if you have the data and pharma can use it and look at the patient population and see that this is quality data, that actually leads into more research dollars getting into the practice. You know, some places have those units, some places don't. The ones that do can actually drive a lot more research if they show that the data is high quality data and that they actually have the patient population that can pass the feasibility test for these patients. So I think it's you know, taking all of the four into account, this is big money for uh, practices. That's uh, very helpful. Uh, let me ask, what is LinksMD's business model? What we do is we have a software as a service uh, model. So anybody using our software is paying licensing for the software. And we have a data licensing model that we work with pharmaceutical companies with and life sciences in general, AI companies. We have a lot of corporations working with the data today analyzing real world evidence. And again, they're paying the software license to use the software, the data license to use the data. And we partner with healthcare provider systems or practices, especially in the gastroenterology that actually generates revenues for the practices. Is it necessary for a practice to be part of a large platform to uh, use your service or uh, can anybody use your service? Anybody can use our service. Data licensing piece becomes more interesting if you have a large patient population or a unique patient population, unique data assets. Very interesting, Omer, because what you're actually talking about is a digital data ancillary. At an earlier time, the ASC was providing ancillary revenues. Pathology was providing ancillary revenues. Anesthesia would provide. There were all these different ancillary channels that were providing revenues to the core. What this seems to me is the potential for them to create a data ancillary because uh, that exactly does not exist. It's happening in bits and pieces, but it's an evolving ancillary, if you will. I actually love that analogy. It ties back into data as the new oil. You need to be able to take advantage of it. IT is a cost center. Everybody's spending a lot of money on it. It doesn't make any money. This is an opportunity for IT to actually start generating revenue for the practice. Let's talk about exponentials and uh, digitization in general, uh, leading up to disruption. I've been in the field from a business and technology standpoint for a while, and I've chance to observe everything from a distance. And when you see things from a distance, you tend to spot patterns. Like So there were patterns that I had spotted earlier. There are certain patterns that I'm spotting now. I think that's what is triggering 
even this conversation with you. Any field that gets digitized, just for clarity, digitization is conversion into zeros and ones. So if a field gets digitized, then it's likely to multiply and move in the direction of exponentials. That is one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, 16, 32, 64, and so on. So when it's multiplying at an exponential rate, eventually that field is likely to get disrupted. Like we've seen it with music. We've seen it with the camera world. We're seeing it all the time. Like, so pretty much every industry right now is getting disrupted. So with that context and background, can you reflect on what does the disruption look like in, you know, for healthcare, uh, for gastroenterology, when things are getting digitized, first of all, maybe you can help us understand how are things getting digitized? Because things are getting digitized, how is it likely to get disrupted? I'd love to pick your mind on this. First of all, I think we're at the cusp of it happening. We're seeing the infrastructure evolve. We're seeing the technology evolve. So I think we're right where we need to. It's the most interesting time. Healthcare traditionally is built on tribal knowledge. You go and you get trained by the best doctor in the field and you become one of those uh, people, and you train the next generation of physicians. What we're seeing, the parallel of the information revolution. Now, doctor goes into practice, they have all of those resources that they didn't have 20 years ago. It's no secret that today people are getting the best uh, level of care that we were able to give to patients in the last hundred or thousands or years. But the rate of change increasing every year. I think medicine 20 years from now is going to look completely different than what it looks today. And AI assistance is one aspect. But when you see a patient and you're able to look at all of the patients that are similar and it actually fits perfectly to this patient, if you can trust that data, which is maybe the hard part. You said it's more of a psychological problem, but also getting the AI to be at that level of accuracy. If you can trust in that and you're actually able to deliver that level of care for your patient, that's very, very different than where we were uh, 10 or 15 years ago. It's amazing. I see one other thing coming on the horizon. Like if a patient realizes he or she is somehow able to get the same level of care or diagnosis from a non-clinician source. And let's say, you know, it could be AI, it could be technology. In the GI field, I've seen patients become providers, you know, with the help of technology. So I see all disruptions on the horizon. It will become mainstream. When this occurs, what do you think would happen to a clinician who is challenged to change or move or who believes that, hey, like, you know, it's, everything is going to stay the same like it has been in the last 10 years, 15 years, even five. I don't think even the last five years, things are going to stay the same, but would love to hear your reflection. They're definitely going to be left behind. Okay. You know, I've been in the technology space over two decades now. And one thing about technology is if you're not up to date in six months, you can lose the entire uh, industry. I don't think we're going to get there in medicine. It's still going to be moving slower, but you have to adapt. You have to grow and you have to lead. If you're not leading, then you're going to be left behind. I definitely think that's the case here. And if people are too slow to react, first thing that's going to happen is they're not going to be able to provide the same level of quality as everybody else. And after that, they're not going to be able to collect the same level or negotiate the same contracts. After that, they're also going to lose patience. If you're leading this, then you're setting the pace and that's where you want to be. And it's in your region, in your community, and it's globally. It's a tough challenge for uh, clinicians, for gastroenterologists, especially because uh, being inside the endoscopy room is so enticing, even today. Uh, so it's hard to, what is the current business logic to get yourself out from there and invest time in something else uh, to build for the future? Not everybody is able to see that far out. That's at the crux of the challenge. I want to ask a different question here as we move towards the end of the interview. The question is about convergence. It's a very exciting time for gastroenterology. If you put the economics aside, if you put all the disruption stuff aside, and if you zoom out and uh, take a broader view, convergence becomes so obvious. If you look at uh, the field of liquid biopsy, where you take a blood sample and you're able to 
detect not just one but multiple types of cancers of which colon cancer you know is one of them but there are other types of cancers that can be detected that is digital biology in action so biology is getting into zeros and ones so with more data it's going to have a multiplier effect if you take the field of tool dna testing tool rna testing i've watched the field evolve in the last few years and it's again uh, has had a multiplier effect and it will continue to have uh, because once again as the labs keep getting more data it gets more sophisticated and more sophisticated like so the outcomes are going to be the sensitivity and specificity will go up again driven by digitization if you look at the field of robotics there are actually a few startups in the field of endoscopy or surgery let's just say broadly uh, where robotics is getting more sophisticated the sensors are getting more sophisticated the uh, image definition is getting way more sophisticated so you know that's happening and then you have all the data revolution the generative ai stuff all of us are putting so much of data whether we like it or not and these algorithms are learning so th that's having a multiplier effect so we're talking about broad convergence you know, that's happening across multiple fields and it's all coming together and it's very steadily coming together what kind of a, an effect would this convergence have in the field of gastroenterology the field is moving relatively fast i think that all of these new technologies they take time to reach maturity and when they do, they need to start playing together with the ecosystem. Like the first thing is, you know, I want to create a proof of concept and show that I can uh, detect cancer in the blood, uh, specific types of cancer. And, you know, how does that change the field? That's the second thing that a company like that has to prove and become part of the ecosystem. The orchestrator of all of this at the end of the day is the gastroenterologist. We can't skip that part, okay? Somebody that had uh, a blood test of high risk of cancer or maybe has cancer, does that mean that they're not going to have a colonoscopy? It's a stretch. At the end of the day, patient-centered care, everybody needs to work together and you want the oncologist to work together with the gastroenterologist, the primary care physician uh, to look at those patients. I think there's a lot of opportunity for gastroenterologists with the development of the technology to become the coordinator and the leader of specific disease areas, especially when you look at IBD, IBS, fatty liver, you know, they're the future. Okay, so I, I don't think that uh, colorectal cancer screening is going to go anywhere in the next few years. I think this is going to be a major revenue driver for everybody in this field. But thinking ahead, thinking about disease management, patient care management, these are places that are going to stay with the gastroenterologists, whatever happens. If I was running a practice today, I would spend time thinking about how to take advantage of the opportunities that are being formed in those areas. You know, there's the traditional business of uh, colonoscopy. What else can we do? What are the ancillary services that we can provide? How can we give full service to the patients, providing the best level of care and also creating new revenue opportunities and reducing the risk of disruption I don't see colonoscopy going anywhere, don't get me wrong, anytime soon. Robotic surgery, robotic colonoscopy is quite far into the future, in my mind at least, I might be wrong. I think a lot of people would be glad to hear. Omer, my final question to you. We've talked about a whole bunch of things, and you've touched upon the future several times. In fact, I think this entire conversation has been about the future. But this is often my last question, usually on the Scope Forward show, which is, what is the future of gastroenterology from your lens? All of the new technology that's being introduced into the field together with the consolidation, all of the data, I think the future of gastroenterology is being able to leverage all of that disruption into a place that the patient gets the full treatment. You know, we have all of the new tools to diagnose better. Uh, we'll have all of the new therapeutic tools to treat the patients better. And getting patients better and not just keep treating the disease and making sure that the patients uh, come back. And um, you need to look at the patient holistically in order to do that. You need all of those to tools in order to do that. And you need to solve the information flow within the ecosystem in order to do that. So there are a lot of new tools out there. People need to keep on their toes and, and keep learning and keep improving and actually use everything that's out there to give better treatment to patients. 
And I think gastroenterologists, at the end of the day, in front of the patient, they're the ones that are going to uh, lead this revolution. If they don't lead this, they're going to be left behind. Super Omer Tror, founder, CEO of LinksMD. It was a pleasure talking to you. And this was a very, very insightful conversation. Thank you so much for educating all of us. Thank you, Praveen. It was a pleasure to be here and to talk to you. I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me.